Well, good morning. My name is Jimmy Smith, and I'm one of the elders here, and it's my privilege to get to speak with you this morning. And uh, just about this stuff going on with Samaritan's Purse and what uh, Ariel's uh, managing for this trip down to Houston, I would highly encourage it. Of course, you would expect me to say something like that, but uh, this is a great opportunity. I know it would create some sacrifice, some time off work, and those kind of things, but this is such a, a great endeavor to give back. Uh, you know, some of the things I've heard is that the, the church in these uh, grief-stricken areas uh, is outpacing like the uh, FEMA and other organizations like that. And that's not a knock on FEMA, but that's a, this is what the church does. Uh, we come, we help our communities, and we come and show the love of Jesus, and this is a, a perfect opportunity to do that. So if you've got the time, it's not a very expensive trip, I uh, would love to, to talk to you about that. So you can talk to Ariel or mark that on your uh, connection card, uh, but just a great opportunity, and I would highly encourage it. So about a year ago, uh, I stood here and preached, and I told you guys about a new ministry that I was jumping into called Horizons International, and I've been with them since uh, April of uh, 2016, and uh, Horizons is an amazing organization, and, and they are uh, laser-focused on helping Muslims around the world find and follow Jesus, and so it's some great ministry, it's some difficult ministry, but there are some amazing things happening uh, in the Muslim world and how God is reshaping the nations and how God is bringing opportunities to them. So I came on in 2016 as the training coordinator. I was very excited to be able to finally focus my ministry efforts towards uh, cross-cultural ministry. Uh, everywhere I've been in church world, I've, I've done administrative work and executive pastor, administrative pastor, but I've always done the mission stuff at the church too. So I've always said that I did a lot of administrative work to support my missions habit because that's what I really liked uh, to be focused on. And so when I had this opportunity to go do this with Horizons, I was very excited. I was fulfilled with a lot of joy and love and all of that. And uh, there's some really great things going on uh, with the ministry around the world, especially in Syria. A lot of work with the uh, Department of Lebanon, a lot of work with Syrian refugees. We actually have some churches that own property inside of Syria as well. But uh, just a quick report of some of the things that have been happening there. Our president, George Tosky, who I work with, um, was recently in Beirut, in Lebanon, <laughs> doing some ministry there. And he sent this report back to the, to the team. And I should share some cool things that are happening. And so George says, since I'm arriving here, I've been in a day with people asking and seeking the Lord and with team meetings. Here are some highlights from the week in Beirut. On Tuesday, I preached at the Kurdish service at our ministry center. Perhaps 250 people filled the courtyard. At least 15 Muslims came forward publicly accepting Christ. Next day, Wednesday, I preached at the Armenian service with about 200 mostly women attending. I was warned that though they come from Christian backgrounds, most of them have not yet received Christ as their Savior. Praise God, 15 or more came forward and gave their lives to Jesus. Next day, Thursday, I preached an Arabic service with over 200 people in attendance. No less than 12 came forward to receive Christ. So some really amazing things happening through the ministry centers here in Lebanon. Um, then he said during the day I met with a translation team or a communications team or a discipleship team, member care team, a lot of staff doing some great things in the region. Then he said, my last day here, I came to purchase a tool from the flea market. And asked George, you know George, she's not going to Home Depot, he's not going to the hardware store, he's going to the flea market. He used to see persuasive to purchase something. To get a tool and talk to a young Syrian man who was seeking for two years, he said. He had not had anyone answer as many questions that he had given up on Islam, but was now seeking an alternative. I spent about two hours with him. He gave him the address of our ministry center and coffee shop. He promised that he would go and seek help. Please, please pray for all these people who heard the gospel, others who are trained, and our whole team who are hard at work expanding the kingdom here and around the Middle East and North Africa. It's hard to express the joy I've experienced watching them praise Jesus and hear your heart share the gospel. George Christie. And so that's just a little of the, uh, the reports I hear all the time of things happening with Horizons that are so encouraging and so amazing, the work that God has told me. And so it's a wonderful organization uh, to be a part of. And through the last year and a half, I've learned so much when I went into working with Muslim Minister. I knew very, very little about it. Uh, but I've had the opportunity to see hundreds go through training programs, through dozens of our, our opportunities to, to train people that are focused on going into the Muslim world. And we have discipleship programs for people who have come out of Islam who are now believers to help them understand you know, a, a lot more about their faith, about Christianity, and coming from a, a Muslim background. There are a lot of things that need to be dealt with and covered and explained to them, and, and you know, especially a lot of just uh, psychological things to deal with. We call that program Cubs Alliance. And so this last year, we had about 100 that came to the Cubs Alliance and developed discipleship week, uh, half in Canada and half in Boulder. Uh, then this upcoming November, we have an, another uh, retreat with believers from the Arab Peninsula. So Saudi Arabia, uh, Oman, Yemen, UAE, Bahrain, uh, that part of the world. And it's for believers to come and get encouraged and discipled and have some time of refreshment and to meet other believers. You don't know how difficult it is for them to congregate and to meet other believers because of the, the laws in our country. And so this is designed for them. Last year we had about 20 Saudis in the same room uh, that were together sometime. It was the first that they ever met at 
want to serve in the mission realm, and I want to serve, and this is just a necessary thing that I have to do. But I've moved on from it being something that I feel is necessary to being something that I'm really excited about doing. And partnering with God on this and watching him uphold me and our family in, in this endeavor. So that's what I've been doing. I've been preparing, and I'm kind of on that journey. I'm hoping to get uh, working through that and be fully funded sometime in early uh, 2018. So that's what I'm doing at this moment and, and finishing strong with Horizons as well. I'm very thankful to those of you who have been current supporters, uh, financial and prayer uh, through our church, things like that. Our church has given as well, and, and, and all of those folks are sticking with me as we transition into Converge as well. So after the message today, there's uh, flyers in the back. I've got a prayer card. Please grab a prayer card, put it on your fridge, put it in your dash, something like that. Remember to pray for our family and, and to see more missionaries called into service. Uh, there's a little brochure that tells a little bit more about my ministry. And then there's clipboards. You can sign up on the clipboard to get my prayer newsletter each month. Uh, or I've got a Facebook group that I post things from here and there. I don't bombard it. But there's a few things from time to time where I'm asking for prayer or great praises and things that God is doing. And then if you'd like to come speak to your small group, uh, community, I'd love to come do that. We can talk about missions and talk about those things uh, together. So you can sign up on any of that for that after the service. All right, so that's a little bit about where we're at. But let's get into our message today. Serving to say, we're in Matthew uh, chapter
service to God's kingdom. You see, you've got it all backwards. What you're asking me, it's not about to get to who I like to this position of authority and power. To get there means suffering and sacrifice, and becoming a servant, becoming a slave. Not every slave, not every servant is a slave, but every slave is a servant. And he's saying here, like, if you want to be the leadership of the kingdom, you're going to take a servant's attitude, and those that will be the greatest in that will be your slave. I wonder if Jesus was. You've got this top down authority structure here. How, how could the guy that's down here on the slave level be the one with all the authority and the power and the blessing and all that? doesn't make any sense. But you're right, it doesn't make any sense. That's not, that's not how the kingdom works, that's how the world works. So what you're asking me to be the greatest in the kingdom? On my right and my left? Are you sure you want to drink from that cup? Are you sure you want to walk the same road that, that I'm walking? But the kingdom is different. And so we see this, this concept of servant leadership. And what, what we decipher through this passage is one of those characteristics, one of the characteristics of a servant leader. But number one, if you're writing along here, the priority for others. First characteristic of servant leadership is it shows a priority for others. Quickly back to verses 26 and 27. But among you it will be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant. Whoever wants to be first among you must become your slave. The prioritization of others, that we're serving others, that we're subservient to others. That it's not about me. It's about others. And I'm telling you, this is the passage that we talk about over and over and over again when we train for our short-term mission trips. This is page one of the training is this, this passage and the passage of Philippians we're going to talk about. Is that when we go, we go with the heart and mind of Jesus to serve others. Mission trips are a blast. They are so much fun. I've got people I can point out in the auditorium right now that can tell you how much fun they are how much enjoyment there is out of it, how much fulfillment there is out of it, if you go with the right attitude. And I tell people very quickly up front, like, listen, I don't know. I can't tell you if we're going to have air conditioning or not at this location. I can't tell you what the hotel is going to look like exactly. I can't tell you that you're not going to get sick. I can't tell you that the food's always going to be wonderful. I can't tell you all these things. But that is absolutely not what's important. It's not about that. It's about going to serve. It's about going to give of ourselves to support our missionaries, to support the work that we're going to be involved in. And that's going to need, I'm going to need you to set aside your personal preference, your comforts, for a little bit of time here so that you can put yourself in a mode of service. And then I trick them to tell them, really, this is a microcosm for your whole life. But we're going to go practice this on the field. So we talk about this verse a lot and having the heart and mind of Jesus when we go to serve. Because this is an upside-down model of authority. Absolutely upside-down. The key to greatness is not found in position or power, but in character. I'm trying to help the disciples understand this, that the kingdom's economy on this is very different. And as you look at your spiritual life, let's just get personal for a moment here. If you look at your own life, are you serving or are you consuming? Are you serving others and demonstrating the love of Christ? Or are you merely a spectator consuming the goodwill and servanthood of others? Now listen, I'm not here to crack a whip. This is for me too. What is it about our lives? Are, are, we, are we prioritizing others? Are we putting others first in our life? And using that as an opportunity to serve, or are we simply consumers of the kingdom? Church is a wonderful place to be on Sundays. We got free coffee. There were some wonderful brownies out there today. The good kind of brownies, not the Colorado brownies. You know, so there's fellowship here, there's great music, I get inspired, I get encouraged, and I walk out the door and I plan on coming back next week at 1045. But did I serve anybody this week? Did I, did I show the love of Christ to anybody this week? Did I invest in that? Did I make room in my life for that? Or are we just consumers? We'll let you come and consume for a couple weeks, but then we want you to get engaged because we want to grow this thing. Not to just build the numbers inside of our walls, but we want to increase the kingdom of God. So are you serving or are you consuming? And listen, we live in a consumer society, right? We like being served so much, we'll pay people to do it. 
Some of you are going to go to lunch and you're going to pay to go out to dinner so that you don't have to cook and you don't have to clean and you can pay someone else to serve you. Not knocking this. I'm just saying, we put a lot of value on being served. In our, we, we don't so even give them extra money for it. You did a good job. Here's some extra money for doing your job. Yes, you should tip. But it's part of, our, part of just who we are. It's really weird when you go to some countries and they don't allow you to tip. That it's like really taboo to like tip. I've been to some of those places. It's weird. And, uh, but it's just ingrained in us. We like to be served. We like to be consumers. And I'm telling you, there's a lot of joy in serving others. How have we made room in our lives to serve others well? You know, we talked about a community group this week about resting, right? And so there was a lot of talk about saying no. There was a lot of talk about prioritizing the things that are important and how to do that and making sure we're taking adequate time for rest. And so one of the things I shared, Amanda and I shared, that we, we had a pastor in California for a while. And when he would give announcements, he would, he would make it like this from time to time. And I always thought this was fascinating. He would say, hey, we've got this thing coming up on Wednesday night, and we need X amount of volunteers, and it's going to be a great thing, and God's going to be glorified. And, and listen, I'm not asking you to add something else to your life this week. I'm asking you to take something out of your life this week so you can put this in its place. And I thought, oh, that's good. We need to reprioritize what we're doing in life so that we can focus on the best things, so we can focus on our families the way that we need to, so we can focus on the kingdom like we need to, we can focus on the church, we can focus on others like we need to. And there's probably, I would just guess, I've got them too, things that we can take out of one bucket in our life and throw them away because they're really just about us. You're not doing a whole lot of positive in the world, right? What, what can you reprioritize in your life? How can you make room in your life to serve others? With what attitudes do we tra- treat those that are under us? And we're talking about a, a different economy here about how we look at leadership. And many of us find our places in leadership and, and working with others and managing teams. Reverend Charles Milliken said this, it is the way one treats his inferiors more than the way he treats his equals which reveals one's character. You ever had a boss that just was, just got it, loved his employees, served them well, encouraged them, those kind of things? Probably some of us have, but we've probably had a lot of bosses the other direction. You know, very authoritarian, top down, do what I say, get it done, jump how high, that kind of thing. And that's the world's economy. Jesus said, my economy is different. The greatest among you will be your servants. And you'll be elevated in leadership the more that you are able to serve people. How are we treating those that God has put under our care and under our direction? Are we trying to serve them well? Or are we trying to just lord over them? I would gather that you'll probably get more productivity out of your team by serving them well rather than authoritating over them well. Now, you've got to crack the, wh- crack the whip every now and then, right? Yeah, people need accountability. People need instruction. But how are you serving your teams? How are you serving your family? What kind of priority are you putting on this in your life. Jesus says that a servant leader will show a priority for others. Number two, a servant leader surrenders in humility. <clears throat> We're going to jump over to Philippians chapter 2 to look at a companion passage here. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 says, You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality of God as something to cling to. Okay? Though he was God, Jesus was God, he did not think of that equality with God as something to cling to. In other words, it was something he was willing to let go of. If you're not clinging to something, you're letting go of it, right? Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. Jesus surrendered himself in humility. Even with all the honor of heaven, Jesus did not think of himself, rather, he thought of others. He submitted himself to the Father's will. And and going back on a a macro level, talking about some spiritual things, the problem, when, when Satan fell, when Lucifer fell, It was out of pride. He said, I will. I will be like God. I will. And Jesus' response is, thy will. Submission to the Father. Submission to the authority. 
And Jesus' example of humility here stands in stark contrast to the pride of Satan. It's a rebuke of Satan's pride. The humility and the action of Jesus to serve others well and to serve the Father. Our pride, too, prevents us from being true servants and representing Christ effectively. I talked about wrestling with consumerism. We wrestle with pride, too, don't we? With Jesus, he gave it all. He went from heaven to earth. He went from glory to shame, master to servant, and from life to death. He gave it all, all for us, for you and for me. This humility with which he served the Father, which he served us, is such an example of what a servant leader needs to look like. And Jesus goes on in another passage here. This is fascinating. In John chapter 13, it's another example of how Jesus illustrates this to his disciples. Last Supper, right? They're sitting around the table. And Jesus says this amazing expression to them to show, him, show them what he's actually talking about. So we're going to blow through this passage real quick. But before the Passover celebration... Jesus knew that his hour had come to leave the world and return to the Father. He had loved his disciples during his ministry on earth, and now he loved them to the very end. It was time for supper, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew the Father had given him authority over everything, and that he had come from God and would return from God. So he got up from the table and took off his robe. I'm going to back up just to give some exclamation point for that. Jesus knew that the Father had given him authority over everything. In that mindset of knowing the authority that he had, he stood up from the table and took off his robe, wrapped a towel around his waist, poured water in a basin, then he began to wash the disciples' feet. I think that is powerful. That Jesus, with all the authority of heaven and earth, God himself lowers himself to the position of a slave, of a servant, and washes the disciples' feet. And Peter, of course, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you don't understand now what I'm doing, but someday you will. No, Peter protested, you will never, ever wash my feet. Jesus replied, unless I wash you, you won't belong to me. Simon Peter exclaimed, then wash my hands and my head as well, Lord, not just my feet. And Jesus replied, a person who has bathed all over does not need to wash except for the feet to be entirely clean. And you disciples are clean, but not all of you. For Jesus knew who would betray him. Talking about Judas. He said, this is what I meant, but not all of you are clean. Verse 12, and after washing their feet, he put on his robe again and asked, do you understand what I am doing? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, because that's what I am. And since I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash others' feet. Remember how Matt talked a few weeks ago about when you follow a rabbi, you, you, you tried to replicate them. You tried to do what they were doing. Jesus says, I have been your teacher and Lord. This is what I am doing. I want you to keep doing this. I have given you an example to follow. I like examples. It helps me <laughs> when I can see someone else do something. Giving you an example to follow. Do as I have done to you. I tell you the truth. Slaves are not greater than their master, nor is the messenger more important than the one who sends the message. Now that you know these things, God will bless you for doing them. So what Jesus does here is reminds them once again, hey guys, you remember when I talked to you about this humility thing, the servant leadership thing? This is what it looks like. This is what it looks like. I'm going to get down in the dirt. I'm going to get down in the yuck. I'm going to get down in the filth. I'm going to take your dirty, stinky feet to show you how serious I am about this. That this is the way that we serve others. This is the way we help people see the kingdom of God. It takes humility to be a servant leader. Number three, the servant leader also senses the need for sacrifice. Senses the need for sacrifice. We have, if you haven't met her yet, I hope you get to someday, Beth Ann Erickson, who's our missionary in Estonia. She's one of these folks that went on a short-term trip and found her way to Estonia. God called her there. She's in her second year. She's learning language. She's doing great. I talked to her on Wednesday. I said, Beth Ann, can I share a little bit of your story on Sunday? And if so, I want to make sure I get the details right here. So we talked for quite a while, and she was good for me to share this. But you may not realize this, but when Beth Ann was being called to 
Estonian. Probably the biggest consideration she had, the thing she had to wrestle with the most, was the health issue that she has. That she has this uh, condition that when it onsets, it's very, very difficult for her. And it has to do with arthritis and joints and things like that. I can't explain it all. But I just know that it knocks her down and pretty significantly. And so she has medication. She's worked with doctors over the years to try to figure this out and, and get the right medication to help her out. And so in the States here, she kind of had a, you know, under control for the most part, but would always have flare-ups from time to time that would just knock her out. She told me that during her time of raising support to go to Estonia, she was in the ER three times because of this condition kept flaring up. And so here she is trying to raise support to go live in another country where she doesn't quite know exactly what's going to be happening with the health care when she gets there. She doesn't know if she's going to be able to find a doctor that knows how to treat this. She doesn't know if she's going to be able to get the medication. All the research that she had done on the medication were that the cost might double for her once she got to Estonia. And this was already very, very expensive stuff. When we would go on short-term trips, she'd say, Jimmy, I've got this medicine. It's got to be refrigerated. I'm like, yeah, 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 no problem. And then she told me how much it was. And then it was like, okay, we've got to take care of this stuff. And so it was very expensive for her. And, and this consideration of having to jump out and do this in Estonia was a big, big deal. And so she worked with Mindy, uh, Crick and Mindy Poyer, who were already over there, and got connected with a doctor when she was over there one summer and, and made a connection. And it turned out God did something amazing, that the cost for her medicine in Estonia is much less than it is here. It's actually free. Free. Absolutely free. She's got insurance through Converge, and this insurance that was covering this is able to take care of those costs for her. Free. So that was a huge blessing. Okay, that's not even in the end of the story. So once she gets there, she's there for you know a year or so, and I was in Lebanon in April with Horizon, and I decided to go to Estonia for a week and do some preaching there and meet with Crick and Mindy and Beth Ann, and just encourage them to see how they're doing. And I was sitting in the coffee shop with Beth Ann in, uh, at Werner's, and we were just chatting and catching up, see where she's at. And I asked her, how's your health been? She's like, I haven't had any problems. I'm like, wait, wait, what? You haven't had any problems? No, no, I haven't had any flare-ups since I've been here. I'm like, wait, weren't you, weren't you struggling with this? Wasn't this something? Yeah. Since I've been here, I've had no episodes. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> I don't know if it's... I know it's God, <laughs> but, you know, maybe it's the diet over there, maybe it's things like that that are helping her out, but whatever. God knew all this. God knew the struggle that she had. God knew the sacrifice that she was going to have to make. God knew how he was going to support her. And I tell you this, I think if Bethany was still struggling with some of those health issues, she'd still be there. But God has made an amazing provision in her life. So about a week after I left from uh, Estonia, she, heard, she went to her doctor. Her doctor says, you're doing so good, let's back your medicine down. Okay, that was a bad idea. After that, she, she had a problem for about a week or so, and then they kind of redialed it back into where it was. But with the medication that she has and, and with the, the, the way the doctors are caring for her and with the health service, God has answered that prayer for her. God has taken away that, that difficulty that was, that was in her way to get to the field. And there are sacrifices to serve the Lord. But there are also amazing ways that God meets all of those needs for us, too. You know, I've preached for years to, my, my, uh, to churches and to my, especially to my short-term missions team. And if God calls you on this trip, he's going to provide the resources and the availability for you to go. And always the first meeting, everybody's like, oh, I don't know about this. I don't know if I can raise $2,000 in the next eight weeks. And I'm saying, look, like, I, I've done this a bunch of times. I've led 26 teams around the world doing short-term trips. And I've never had somebody not be able to go because of finances if they put the work into it that I asked them to. God has always met that need for our team. And we don't do a lot of fundraisers. We, we kind of do this direct ask thing. And I tell them all the time, like, God doesn't put a catcher in the game and not give him a glove. You, know, you don't put your star quarterback in the game and not give him a helmet. If God's going to call you to, he's going to provide for that. And I see that in Beth Ann's life. I see that in my life right now with the things I'm attempting to do. And that's a big old step to go... Go into that 100% uh, fundraising thing. But I've been growing in that. I've been learning about that. I've been, I've been studying it, getting some training. And I'm excited about those next steps. But there's always sacrifice when it comes to being a servant leader and to serving for the kingdom. Verse 28, let's back up there again. Verse 28 of Matthew, chapter 20. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to what? Give his life. Hey, that's kind of the ultimate sacrifice, right? Came to give his life. Dr. J 
H. Jowett says, ministry that costs nothing accomplishes nothing. Ministry that costs nothing accomplishes nothing. The Bible always promises sacrifice and difficulty in proclaiming the gospel. Now listen, when we talk about God's promises, we're always like, ooh, good blessings, promises, good things. The Bible always promises that with the proclamation of the gospel will come suffering and sacrifice. We, we spend a lot of time on this topic with people going into Muslim countries to go work uh, with, with Muslims. Because it is difficult. God is not calling you to something that's going to be peaceable. It's valuable. It's joyful. But the Bible always promises this. You see it all through the life of the disciples and through Paul. And often people excuse their selfishness, their pride, their evil by claiming their rights. I have the right. I deserve this. As believers, we should be able to lay aside our rights in order to serve others. This was the example of Jesus. Jesus had all of the authority. He deserved all of the praise, all of the glory. But he did not cling to that. He let it go so that he could come and serve us and pay the price for our sin. Jesus is not calling us to a Western lifestyle. He's not calling us to the American dream, a comfortable existence, or life without difficulty. Jesus consistently reminds us and demonstrated to us that the cause of the gospel is far more important and will require extreme sacrifice. And for Jesus, it was his life. And Jesus had said earlier to the disciples, yeah, you will indeed drink from this bitter cup. You don't know what you're asking right now. I want to try to explain that to you because you are going to drink from this cup. But this position of authority and power that you seek, it's not being granted as a favor. It's going to be rewarded for those who serve others for the kingdom purpose and who lay it all down on the line. Those are the greatest in the kingdom. So lastly, after sensing a need for sacrifice, the servant leader knows how to share the gospel. To share the gospel. Verse 28, the last part of that again, came not to be served but to serve others and to give his life. Why? As a ransom for many. The reason Jesus came and gave it all was to be that ransom. He was not, did not only have the attitude of a servant, he demonstrated it in his actions. He came and he laid it all in line and it was a ransom for the price of sin. He paid the debt that you and I could not pay. This was the end result of his serving others. That is the end result of what we want to see when we serve others is that people come into the kingdom, that people experience the life-giving salvation of Jesus Christ. And for Jesus, that meant giving it all. There were no deal breakers for Jesus. There were no deal breakers. It wasn't like, well... I'm happy to go to Estonia as long as my health considerations are taken care of. She was well on her way before any of that was resolved. She didn't know that once she got there, she would be healthy all the time. There were no deal breakers for Jesus. It went all the way up to his death. Even in the garden, he said, Father, if, you, if this cup can pass from me, I'm good with that. But if not, thy will be done. Laid it all on the line for us. He did it for our salvation. And when, we, when the world sees our service, our humility, and our sacrifice in the image and example of Christ, many will be saved. Many will be saved. If I can give some statistics to you. There are 6,500 people groups that are considered unreached. This will be less than 4% evangelical. Estonia is one of those places. Very atheistic country where Beth Ann is serving. 6,500 people groups, still less than 4% evangelized. That comprises 42% of the world's population. Over 3 billion people. It will take servants to reach them. People who prioritize others surrender in humility, and sacrifice whatever it takes to get the gospel to them. Of that 6,500, there are 1,350 people groups identified that have no known gospel presence. So not even 4%. We're talking no known gospel presence. 1,350 of those people groups. 
Why? Because it's been difficult to identify and reach them. It will take servants to reach them. People who prioritize others, surrender in humility, and sacrifice whatever it takes to bring the gospel to them. And this is a major focus of Convergence, that we're focusing on the least reached. There are one million international students in U.S. universities, many coming to the United States and into our universities from, from countries that are very, very closed, don't have a gospel presence, or where it's very, very limited. And while they're here, the church has an amazing opportunity to reach into their lives. It's one of the amazing things I've seen happen through Horizons and some partner ministries that we work with. But to reach these million national students, it's going to take people that prioritize others, surrender in humility, and sacrifice whatever it takes to get the gospel to them. There are five, I'm sorry, three million people living in the Denver metro area. Seven to nine percent of those attend church on a Sunday morning. Welcome to the seven to nine percent. There's three million of us here. Less than 10% feel the need to be a part of a church. Listen, to reach them, it's going to take servants who prioritize other people, surrender in humility and sacrifice whatever it takes to reach people with the gospel. There's 75,000 people that live in Stapleton. That number has grown quite a lot since we launched in 2007 over in the school across the street. And there are only five churches in Stapleton. Yes, there's some around the fringe, but in Stapleton there are five churches, and one of them just opened a week ago. Stapleton has been the place where church plants come to die. There have been many, many guys come in here, try to plant, and they just can't make it work. Not for lack of trying. There have been a lot of, a lot of autopsies performed on church plants in this area. We're blessed to be where we are at this point in time, to have a facility, to have some resource, to have a great, solid group of people. God has blessed us, and we don't take that for granted. But there's 75,000 people here, and there's five churches. My hometown, 3,500 people, 35 churches. One to 100 ratio. Not too bad. Buckle of the Bible belt. Okay? 75,000, five churches, not enough. And to reach them, it's going to take servants who prioritize others, who surrender in humility, and who sacrifice what it takes to bring the gospel to them. That's the kind of church we want to be. We want to be a church that loves in the example of Jesus, that serves in the example of Jesus, that leads people to Christ in the example of Jesus. And it's not always easy. It's difficult. But God lifts us up in the difficulties. He provides for us in the difficulties. So what did God do through Jesus' servanthood? If we look at the last part of that Philippians passage that we looked at, going into verse 9. So verse 8 said, He humbled himself into obedience and gave his life on the cross. Then verse 9, Therefore God elevated him to the highest place of honor and gave him the name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue declare that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. What did God do through Jesus' sacrifice? He lifted him up and gave him the name above all names. So when the disciples were asking, how do I get to sit on the right or the left? This is how it's done. It's not about playing favorites. It's not about giving some authoritarian direction. It's by serving others to help bring the gospel to them. It says here that every tongue would declare that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's every nation. Every nation. The whole purpose of Jesus' humiliation and then exaltation was to glorify God. It was to give Him the glory, to give Him the praise, to pay man's price for sin, to bring people back into connection with the Father. The heart of missions is to serve. And with that will come sacrifice. But God will lift us up. God will provide all of it to the glory of the Father and to the salvation of the world. Who is God calling you to? Wait a minute, Jimmy. I'm, I'm not on staff here. I'm just a guy that comes. And says, Who is God calling you to? Disciples were just fishermen when they were called. Right? A lot of them. They said, wherever, go over, just 
We'll go with you. Did they know everything to start at the beginning? No. A lot of the, a lot of the Gospels are teaching how the disciples needed to learn a thing or two, how to understand what Jesus was really doing, this passage included. Who is God calling you to? Who in your life needs to know about Jesus? Who in your life can you serve? Who can you make room for to serve in your life? Maybe you're, maybe you're being called to at least reach people of the world. You might not even know where to go. Hey, I'll walk with you on that. I'll help you figure it out. I'll encourage you along the way. I'll, I'll find whatever training you need. I'll connect you with the right people. If you want to go serve God in the jungle somewhere or a big city somewhere, I will walk with you through that. Jesus will walk with you through that. What's God calling you to do in your life? Who is he calling you to reach with his message. And listen, this serving element is so important that we come alongside and show the love of Jesus, but there needs to come a point where you open your mouth too. Because we're serving to see people saved. There has to come a point where it's like, you know why I'm doing this, right? Because I love you. And I found what Jesus did for me, and it's so awesome, and I would love for Jesus to do for you what he did for me. You know, that question comes up all the time on, on these short-term trips that we do. People will say, why, why, why are you guys here this week? Why, why did you come all the way from the U.S. just to run a, a vacation Bible school? Because I love you. I love Jesus. And Jesus says that I'm supposed to love other people and to serve other people and to help them find out what Jesus did for me. Can I just take a second and show you how much Jesus loves you? At some point, we move from that open door of service and serving people to opening our mouths and sharing about Jesus. I know some of you are just like petrified with that right now. That might be your sacrifice. That might be the thing you've got to jump over. And just like God held up Beth Ann, he will hold you up. But yeah, there's some sacrifice involved. There's, some, there's no promise that you won't be rejected. Who is God calling you to? Here's the big idea for today we've been talking about. Following the example of Jesus, sacrifice and service are the attitudes of mission, sacrifice and service. And here's our simple challenge today. Serve others in the example of Christ to bring them into relationship with Christ. Serve others in the example of Christ to bring them into relationship with Christ. Can we do that? Can we be a church that models the actions and attitudes of Jesus to serve other people? I guarantee if we do that, people will come to know Jesus. This place will grow. The kingdom will grow if we serve other people. If we come in here and we sit and we soak and we consume, we will not only plateau, we will shrink and we will die. But if we serve others and invite them into the kingdom, there's no stopping us. There's no stopping the movement of the gospel. Are we going to be that kind of people? Who's God calling you to? Let's pray. God, thank you so much for this morning, for the opportunity to share about your heart and your your love for us. Thank you so much for the great sacrifice that you made. Thank you for giving it all and teaching us what that looks like. God, help us to make some adjustments in our life today, some adjustments in our thinking, in our heart, in our hands, in our feet. Maybe this moves someone to to jump on that Houston trip. Maybe this moves someone to talk to their neighbor. Maybe this moves someone to, to, to go to another country to help a least reached people group find Jesus. It's going to take servants that are willing to prioritize others, surrender, humility, sacrifice, share the gospel. Let that be us. Let that be our church. Let that be me. And we'll give you the praise and the glory and the honor. In Jesus' name, amen.